Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to MIT Faculty Forum Online. Uh, my name is Aviva Rutkin. I am the data editor at The Conversation, and I'm going to serve as your moderator today. Um, today's broadcast is sponsored in part by the MIT Federal Credit Union, MIT Professional Education, and MIT Sloan Executive Education. Uh, before we get started, as a reminder, we welcome your questions during this chat. Um, if you are joining us via Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature found on your toolbar, and I think you can use that to upvote questions um, from other listeners as well. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can also add your comments, uh, your questions to the comments field right next to the stream. Um, and we're going to try to get to as many as we can today. So uh, I'd like to introduce everybody to Calvin Newport. Uh, Cal is the Provost Distinguished Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Science at Georgetown University. He's the author of six books, um, most recently, uh, Digital Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World. That's what he's going to talk to us about today. So welcome, Professor Newport. Well, thank you, Aviva. I'm, uh, I am happy to be here. Uh, and what I'll do, since I don't have the chat open, if there's, if there's any issues, let's say like my audio cuts out of this or that, I'll just, I'll just assume that, uh, Aviva, you'll unmute and tell me something. So that'll, you'll, you'll be sort of my conduit to- I'll wave my hands in the air, yeah. <laughs> you'll be my conduit to information. Uh, so it is, it, it is, uh, I appreciate and I'm honored to be able to speak with uh, some of my, my fellow MIT alumni. Um, what I've learned from my students in the past few weeks is that really long slideshows don't do well over Zoom type format. So what I'm going to try to do is I, I do, I'm going to talk for a little bit, but not too long. So I have some slides just to get you a little bit of the backstory on this book and just to summarize the main idea so that we're all on the same page. Then I hope after that to switch this over to Q&A after that, because I think uh, there's a lot of interesting questions swirling. I think we're in a very uh, an unusual and challenging times that has some some pretty big impacts on the thesis of this book, among other things. So I look forward to that portion of it. But I thought what I'd do is get started here um, by actually just giving you the, the background uh, on this book. So I'm going to share slides here. And I am not going to pull out my, I have a, a, a tablet pen I use to teach my, my graduate students. Uh, when I teach them theory, or I can draw notes and, and um, I have terrible handwriting on that, so I'll spare you that. Um, so I'm going to use a few slides here to tell you a little bit about this book, Digital Minimalism. Uh, as mentioned, this is a book that came out last year. It came out last February. Let me give you the backstory on it. So to understand this book that came out last year, we have to go back to a book I published before it, a book I published back in 2016, which was this one, Deep Work. Roughly speaking, you can think of this older book as being about some unexpected influences or impacts of technology on the world of work. So this was a book really about the world of work and in particular the impact of tools like, let's say, email on the ability of knowledge workers to actually produce valuable knowledge with their brain. So it's about tech and the world of work. So after that book came out in 2016 and had been out for a little while, there was some lag here. I began to hear from my readers the same feedback again and again, which was, okay, maybe we buy some of these premises about what's happening with tech in the world of work, but what about technology in our personal lives? So I began to hear from these readers that there was something interesting going on with technology in their, per their personal lives. In particular, there seemed to be a growing sense of uneasiness that people were starting to develop with the relationship they were having, for example, with their phones or with their tablets something had, had changed in the zeitgeist out there where people went from exuberant towards uneasy. Now, I could actually pinpoint more or less when this change happened just based on the public reactions I was getting to my own work. I've been doing public facing work in tech on society for, for a long time. I'm out there, I give a lot of speeches, I write books, I write a lot of op-eds, and so I have a, a pretty good temperature. I can take a pretty good temperature of the public's thoughts on these issues by just the type of feedback I get. And so just based on the feedback I was getting in this period, I can kind of pinpoint where we had this shifting relationship, where we shifted from exuberance towards some uneasiness towards the technology in our personal life. So let me try to make this a little bit more concrete. 
So here's an example from before I begin to sense the public sentiment shifting. This was a talk I gave in 2016, early in 2016, it was a, a, a TEDx talk, and I gave a talk that was uh, anti-social media. So I, I wanted to call the talk, Quit Social Media. And just to give you a sense of the, the zeitgeist back in early 2016, the organizers of this event were very worried about that. That seemed like a very eccentric thing to say at this time. When they uploaded the video to YouTube, they changed the name back to something like how to work deeply in a distracted something something. And I made them change it to, to quit social media. They were very uncomfortable. So we can use this as a data point in 2016, early 2016, people were a little bit nervous or a little bit amused by the idea that you would have a, a talk that was uh, explicitly negative about social media. As many people pointed out later, uh, look here, as many people point out later, you can actually see in the audience during my talk, people using social media on their phones. So we can tell at this point that I was, I was uh, not in the majority in my thinking. So here's another data point. Uh, this is an, an op-ed I wrote for the Times a little bit after this, but still in 2016. Um, it was an op-ed that said some negative things about social media in the context of your careers. I was essentially making the argument that uh, young people in particular were overemphasizing or exaggerating the importance of their social media presence when it came to career development. This article triggered an incredibly sharp backlash. So again, I use this as a data point to understand where we were in our society. Uh, people were very upset about there being an op-ed that was saying explicitly negative things about social media. The New York Times actually commissioned a response op-ed, which they ran the next week. So they went out there and they got the, the social media manager for monster.com to write an op-ed about mine to say, don't listen to this op-ed. So this just gives you a sense of where we were as a culture. I was, I was considered kind of eccentric. That changed pretty rapidly. So now let's go forward no more than a year or so, and that talk that made the uh, organizers of TED worry because it seemed so eccentric started to get some more views. So this was from last year, you know, it was up to close to 6 million views. It's sort of well over that now. So something was changing. People were kind of interested in this. I've since written multiple other op-eds for the Times also about similar types of arguments. The backlash has been non-existent. There is no, as happened last time, people actually writing, you know, columns about how my column was so wrong. There seems to be more of a general sort of acceptance or interest in these ideas. So I can, I can kind of time this shift. Somewhere between 2016 and 2017, we saw this shift in our culture. Where, again, we began to become uneasy about these technologies in our personal life that up until that point, we had been much more comfortable or interested in. And so that's what I wanted to tackle in this book. Two questions stemming from that. One, why did we suddenly get so uneasy about these technologies? What happened? And two, what should we do about that? So once we understand why we got uncomfortable, what's the right way to deal with these technologies so that we avoid whatever these negative aspects are that was making us uneasy? That's the idea behind this book. Those are the two questions that I tackled. And what I wanted to do today was just give you briefly three of the big ideas from the book surrounding those two questions so that we can at least be on the same foundation. All right, so here's the first big idea from the book. Uh, to illustrate this idea, autonomy, not usefulness, a brief story I think is uh, illustrative. So I did this interview, again, this is back in that 2016 period where, where people were still on team social media for sure. And so around this period, I, I do a lot of radio. I did a radio appearance for a, a CBC, a Canadian radio show called The Current. They had asked me on just to talk about my thoughts about uh, social media. I believe this was in response to that original Times op-ed. So I go on air, it's live. So uh, I'm on air, they're asking me some questions about it, and then the, the host springs an ambush. They say, okay, well now joining us in the conversation, we have, uh, it was an artist who uses social media to market his work and make a living, and then it was also some other social media expert. So this was gonna be the ambush, like, aha, you know, we've got you, <laughs> uh, see social media is not terrible or whatever it was they were trying to say. But something interesting happened in this conversation. They were talking to the artist who says, yes, he does use Facebook to help find uh, customers for his art. But then at some point unprompted, he mentioned he has to take long breaks 
because if he didn't take long multi-month breaks from social media, he couldn't get any art done in the first place to sell. And it was in that comment that we actually get to the crux of what, when you actually go out there and research, people seems to be making people uneasy about these technologies. It is not, as is often portrayed, the specific things that people do when they look at their phone or their tablet. It's not what they're seeing on social media. It's not the particular information. It's not so much even concerns about what happens to their data, even though that's very relevant to those of us who study technology and society. I was surprised the degree to which the average social media user doesn't really care that much about that either. The thing that was making us uneasy starting around 2017 was more this. The idea that we were looking at these devices more than we wanted to, or more than we thought was useful. That the fact that we were looking at these things so much that it was starting to take time away from other things that were more important or more valuable to us. And so it was this sense that we were losing autonomy over how we spent our time that was a deeper source of the wide unease that I, my readers were picking up than it is any particular activity that was going on in the phone. And it's an important point because it shows that there's a real disconnect between let's say uh, the coverage of the newly emergent anti-social media backlash, which focuses very extensively on what happens on, on these platforms and what happens with the information. There's a really a disconnect between that and what was making the public writ large starting to become really uncomfortable, which is much more about autonomy. So how did that happen? Why do we use phones more than we want to or more than we think is useful? Well, this was the other big idea that came out of this research, uh, which I can really capture by this quick thought experiment. If you got a time machine and you went back to, I'm gonna say like 2000, 2008, let's say. So back to around 2008 or maybe late 2007, pretty soon after the introduction of the iPhone, and you took someone off the street and brought them back to roughly our times. Now for this thought experiment to work, I think we can't bring them back right now because we're in the middle of a pandemic. But let's say we brought them back to three or four months ago, let them out of the time machine and said, what do you see that's different? Most of what they, they would look around and notice would be basically what they had seen 10 years ago. The cars would look basically the same. Uh, in 2008, we had iPhones, social media existed. We had laptop computers, we had 3G. Uh, it, you know, looking around the world, it would look substantially the same, except for there would be one difference, like one major difference you would immediately notice if you came from 2008 to let's say three or four months ago, and that would be this behavior we forget the extent to which this model in which our phone is a constant companion is more newly emergent than we recall. We think about this as being fundamentally what you do with these phones. You look at them all the time. It's not what we used to do with smartphones. It's not what a circa 2007 or 2008 iPhone user would do. This behavior actually came a little bit later. It's not really till you get to this sort of 2010 to 2012 period before, before you really begin to see phones as a constant companion, something that we look at all the time. So where did that come from? The social media companies. So we, we know about this at first because we've had some whistleblowers like Tristan Harris, formerly of Google and others uh, who have begun to inform us about the type of changes that happened to the major social media platforms during this period, changes that were designed to drastically increase the amount of time we actually spent looking at these platforms on our phone. It gets a little complicated, but there's two major classes of changes that happened. The first was the introduction of the like button and similar features. The like button was a game changer. Among other things, what it meant was now, when you checked a social media account, the prize was not just, I'm going to see some interesting information about what someone I know is up to. The prize now became, I am going to get uh, information about other people's approval or lack of approval of me. It's an incredibly powerful stimulus. And you really get a slot machine effect when you think every time I hit that icon on this device, there's gonna be a number that quantifies the degree to which other people are thinking of me or not thinking about me, the degree to which they're approving of me or not approving of me. That is almost irresistible. It's very difficult to uh, ignore that type of stimulus when it's always one tap away. The other thing that happened during this period is that social media switched from their, their original format. I'm gonna focus on Facebook here in particular because they led the way here. 
their original format, if you remember, was let's take the idea of the personal website or the personal blog and let's make it significantly more convenient, right? This was the original idea. So it's easier for me to set up a Facebook profile than it was for me to rent some server space and set up a WordPress instance. That was the original idea. Facebook used to operate this way. You would have a profile. Your friends would have a profile. You would occasionally log on to see what your friends were up to. Ah, they went on a trip. Here's some pictures. That's interesting, right? So it was about seeing what people you knew were up to. It was about digitizing person-to-person -person interactions that you used to do more analog. 2010, 2012 period, this format gets switched and the services starting with Facebook got recentered around a timeline format where now you have an infinite scroll algorithmically filled timeline that pulls from various people's updated profiles and puts it into the stream of information that's been optimized to be uh, appealing in the sense that, it, that it's gonna maximize the time that you spend engaged with the service. This is a completely different type of thing. It's not what people originally signed up for. Now, when you're on social media, you can just endlessly scroll these algorithmically optimized selections of information that makes it very difficult to stop consuming. So they shifted from the original premise, which is it makes it easy for you to talk about what you're up to and see what your friends are up to, and instead made it into an information, uh, highly optimal, endless feed information stream that's very difficult to pull away from once you're in it. Tristan Harris here uh, in his famous 60 Minutes interview talked a lot about how you can then uh, manipulate or engineer this stream to hijack attention in such a way that it becomes very, very difficult to stop looking at it once you see it. So this transformation happened after smartphones came along, after social media came along, this transformation happened that suddenly made these services an order of magnitude more sticky than they were before. We didn't even notice it happened, but as a result, we got retrained to look at our phone all the time. So this was an interesting observation that this, this thing that's now making us unhappy is not a logical consequence of it's a, a social media network. It's not a logical consequence of having a wirelessly connected smartphone. It is a particular consequence of a particular business model that was executed to great effect. So what do we do about this? Well, this brings us to the third idea that basically people that seem to be doing uh, well with this technology and avoiding these issues, a lot of them shared a philosophy that I eventually gave the name digital minimalism. And it's a relatively straightforward philosophy, but essentially what it says, and this is what I propose to people, is that you start with, here's what I care about. Here's my values. Here's what I want to spend time doing in my life. Step two, once you know what you want to be doing, you ask, okay, now looking at all of these wonderful, innovative technological tools that have been developed in the last 20 years, what's the best way to deploy some of these tools to really amplify these things I care about? And then step three, and this is the crucial part, comfortable, be comfortable ignoring everything else. So it essentially uh, inverts the way that a lot of people had been uh, approaching these technologies in the first 10 years after their introduction, which is really the exuberant stage of the cycle for new tech, so that makes sense. But the way that we have been approaching these was what you might call maximalism, which was if this device, if this app, if this service might offer anything that's valuable, I should probably bring that into my life because, hey, I don't want to leave something valuable on the, I don't want to leave it on the ground, right? I see the $5 bill, I want to pick it up. And so we had been uh, approaching this from a maximalist point of view. Hey, if there's something that could be useful, why don't I try this? And because of that, we became overwhelmed with these services. We had too many of them in our lives. They became too addictive and sticky. And we lost control over the really high value activities that we're, we're usually much happier with. So minimalism flips that script. Start with what you want to do and then deploy tech strategically to amplify it. It gives you a completely different relationship with your tools. Because now not only are you more selective in your tools, but now that you know why you're using a particular tool, it's much easier to optimize that. If the only reason you use Facebook is because there's a particular Facebook group that is very important to you and you know that, then it's much easier to realize, I don't need this on my phone. It should just be on my computer. And if I'm just using a Facebook group, then why don't I use a plugin like Newsfeed Eradicator so I don't have to see that algorithmically optimized timeline. I could just go straight to my group and do the thing that I really want to do. It puts the control back in the uh, seat of the user. It tips that cost-benefit ratio usually decidedly in your advantage. 
So one way I try to personify the minimalist approach, and I think this has become particularly relevant where we are right now, is to look to Plato's metaphor of the chariot driver. This is from his Phaedrus dialogue, where he gives this metaphor to help understand the human soul. And he said, one way we can understand the human soul, it's like we have the chariot driver, who's like the, the, the rational part of our brain. They wouldn't have used those terms back then, but we can think of it as like the rational part of our brain. And he's trying to steer the chariot, which is in some sense our, our, our soul's journey through life. And he has two steeds that he's trying to control. And, and one is a noble steed. The noble steed uh, represents our, our noble impulses, so our, our moral intimations, our moral intuitions about what feels like what is good in life. And then you have the ignoble steed that represents more of our baser instincts. And the, the chariot driver is trying to control these things and, and keep the chariot moving in the more noble direction. A lot of what happened in the last 10 years is that technologies that we brought into our personal life for relatively innocent or logical reasons sort of transformed while we weren't paying attention and ended up supercharging the ignoble steed. And we look up and realize that this ignoble steed that represents our sort of just sort of base in the moment whims and impulses is really leading where the chariot is going. The minimalist response is to say, wait, 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 let's be more strategic. Let's use technology in such a way that it's specifically designed to give the noble steed more power, that it actually helps us go where we want to go. And I just want to end this brief introduction by noting where we are now, let's say, with the current coronavirus pandemic is really emphasizing the importance of this, this dichotomy that we have here, right? It really makes it very clear that what we're all experiencing is that these new technologies, when used strategically right now, can give incredible power to the noble steed. It allows us, for example, to check in with Zoom, with family and friends. It allows us to look up quickly ways that we can be useful to our communities. It can, it can empower the part that is noble. But the danger has also been incredibly amplified that if we just give in to scrolling through what's going on on Twitter or, or compulsively looking at the news stories all day long about what's wrong or, 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 or what's going wrong or what could go wrong or what's the next thing that could go bad, that same technology has the, has the ability to essentially pull our chariot into a cowering sort of fetal position of, of fear and inaction. So what is happening now, I think, greatly clarifies the, the, the stakes that are being captured by this philosophy, that when we put this tech to use for what matters, for what's important to us, it makes our life better. When we don't, when we, when we are not very thoughtful or systematic about what we use and why. It is very easy for the ignoble half of this metaphorical soul to pull us into places that makes our life much worse. That's the complicated dualism that we're facing with these technologies. And by recognizing it, we can again move the probability of coming out good in our life or using this tech on the good more than bad. It becomes much, much more likely that we end up in a good place once we understand what these forces actually are. So I'm skipping all the details here, the, the details of how minimalism works and the, the experiments I ran where, where we, we, we took thousands of people and, and had them do declutter their digital lives and become digital minimalists and what I've learned. And th there's a whole lot of interesting things there, a whole lot of strategic ideas as well. There's also the whole world of digital technology and work, which is different, but something that I write extensively on and has some overlap. But I'm going to leave that all on the table because what I want to do is move towards uh, letting the audience, you yourself, actually lead what we discuss with the questions. So I will, I will sort of step back from my slides now, and with uh, Aviva's help, I'm hoping she can point me towards some questions. Like to see what it is that you would like to talk about. Yeah, we've had um, we've got 13 questions in so far. Just a reminder um, that you can still add your questions and, and upvote ones you like. Um, and I'll go with one of the crowd's top. I'll let the crowd decide the first one. One of our top questions is from Jeff D. He wants to know, you know, what are some ways to benefit from the connections that these tools can enable uh, while minimizing the downsides? I think the Zoom example you just gave was, was a great example of that, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, one of the interesting things that I found in my research is that type of, when you're talking about digital connections, type of digital connection actually matters. 
So uh, an analog component to the connection makes a vast difference. Most of the, the social circuitry in our brains, and our brains has incredibly advanced social circuitry, it's the, the key to our species success, has nothing to do with linguistic communication. That's very new and for the most part linguistic communication just sort of hijacks existing parts of the brains in, in sort of complicated ways. So any interaction that is purely linguistic, so just text, like a text message or a comment left on a social media post or an emoji in a text message, anything that's just pure text is from the perspective of your social circuits a, a severely impoverished form of interaction. Uh, it's of course useful. Uh, historically, we've had sort of wonderfully productive uh, epistolary back and forth with people writing letters. We have Jefferson and Adams famously sending letters back and forth. I mean, it's a very useful mode of communication, but from the point of view of not feeling isolated, from the point of view of feeling connected, from the point of view of nourishing the human drive for connection, if you can hear a voice, it really makes a big difference. If you can see someone and hear a voice, that makes a huge difference. Um, there's actually a, a professor at MIT right now, Alex Pentland, who, who wrote a great book about this about a decade ago. Um, I believe it was called Social Signals, but it goes into the degree to which the majority of the back and forth information exchange that happens when I'm talking with you in person, the vast majority of it has nothing to do with the actual words I'm saying. It's how my body's moving. It's the inflection of my voice. It's how we're, we're, we're coming in and out of the conversation together. You lose all of that in just text. So in a period of social distancing, the more you can maintain an analog component to your interactions, the better. The more that you can, let's say, outside talk to someone else with whatever the magic distance is, six feet or whatever it is, and actually see in real time that the, the full human body there is sounds like it's arbitrary. It makes a huge difference from the point of view of feeling like you're actually satisfying your social instincts. Okay, let me let me follow that up with one of uh, a question from Michelle. She wants to know. She says, uh, or he, I don't know. I'm very worried about the acknowledged impact of social media on our children and teens, and that we're creating a generation of people who've never been away from social media. How do you help parents raise digitally minimal, minimalist kids? Yeah, it's it's a really important issue, and and one thing I'll tell you about it is that uh, it's a really interesting research literature. So anytime you look at a social psychology research literature, you're never gonna get clear signals. So those of us that, well, I'm a computer scientist, so not a, not, not a lab scientist, but those of us who, who in the community who, who are from an MIT lab science background, you don't get that type of clarity from it. It's very difficult to pull apart confounding factors. Um, and there's also an effect going on right now where especially coming out of the UK, and it's not quite sure, a few labs in the UK, there's a real contrarian impulse where there's kind of a, a reward to be given for trying to really uh, shake up any attempts to say that social media is for sure having negative impacts on, on teens and youth. And so um, it's a confusing literature, but you know, having spoken with many of the sort of really the top people in these fields, what I come away with is like, yes, it's a confusing literature, but almost for sure social media use in teenagers, and in particular teenage girls more so than teenage boys, is having uh, non-trivial uh, effects on mental health. And uh, I think the most important data point here is that teenagers will tell you this themselves. So typically when we're doing epidemiological research, you're trying to actually tease out an effect that you can't directly experience yourself. You don't directly feel that the, that the lead in your water is increasing your cancer incidence. We have to use these statistical epidemiological studies to try to tease that out. But when it comes to mental health effects on teenagers, you just talk to the teenagers, they will say, yes, this thing I do all the time on the phone is making me feel bad, is making me feel anxious. So we, we get the direct reports. And so I think it's actually a, a, a really big issue and there's a lot of sort of uh, evidence around it. So what should we actually do about it? I think smartphones and social media use needs to be introduced much later. Uh, I think we're getting to a point where the argument of, but my friends do it, is going to be insufficient. Uh, I think almost everything that we prohibit teens from doing, that that is, a, that is an argument that the teens could give while other people are doing it, everyone else is doing it. The psychologist Jonathan Haidt at NYU, who, who, who I want to say actually maintains a, on his website, uh, I don't know if, it's, if it's, it's publicly available, I don't know if he links to it. He maintains a great annotated bibliography, by the way, on the social psych research on teens and social media use. He likes to say that uh, positive deviance matters here. So you don't need, for example, everyone in your son or daughter's class to stop using social media before it's socially acceptable for them not to do it. You need probably two people not to do it. 
and then that sets the standard. That's one of the options. So I'm hoping our culture on this is going to shift really quick. But my, my big picture is I think we're going to see a shift pretty soon in which we're thinking about 14, 15, 16, all being inappropriately young ages, given right now the power of these tools and its impact on people's livelihood. So if uh, my kids are all young right now, my oldest is only seven, but if they were older, I would have a much harder line drawn there. I would rather figure out the, the, the social impacts of you not being on Snapchat than I would want to have to deal with the uh, psychological impacts of you being on those tools all the time. Since we're talking about kids, I want to just turn to another question. It's from an anonymous attendee. They wanted to know about the research showing about constant phone use and satisfaction in, in marriage and other relationships, if there's anything out there on that. I don't know about the research on that, um, but I do know it's almost certainly an issue. One of the biggest questions I get about this from my readers is typically, how do I get my spouse <laughs> to stop looking at their phone all the time? My advice in this arena has always been, and this deals with parenting as well, what I call the phone foyer method, which is when you come home, the phone goes, let's say in your foyer by the front door, whatever position you want to, wherever you want to use, that's where the phone stays, in the house. So if you need to look something up, you go to the foyer where the phone is and you look it up. If you, someone's calling you, you have the ringer on, just like we used to do. You go and get the phone and talk to them. If you're expecting text messages, you have to get up and go over there and check it. It's an incredibly powerful tool because it prevents this sort of thing that we have now where we, we are eroding the sort of intrafamilial interaction rhythms by doing this all the time. And so it's a simple rule that gets there. Also, it shows your kids. See, if your kids see you in the house always looking at this, it becomes much more difficult to actually uh, keep them on a, a technological regime that's gonna be more healthy for them. Just like if you're a heavy drinker, it's harder for you to, to uh, sort of make this argument that like you, you, you shouldn't be drinking. And so I'm a big advocate for that. Uh, simulate the old phones that used to be stuck on the wall. There's gonna be great fam family benefits to it. So that's a, that's a really great tip. And, you know, there's a question here from Paul that has a lot of upvotes where he just wants to know about if there are other impactful ways to break compulsive online habits. And I'm just going to abuse my moderator privilege and tack onto that too. I'm someone who's tried to, a lot of different ways to use my phone less. And I'm curious if there's anything you see people doing that's not effective that you would recommend not doing as well. Um, well, well, the big thing I noticed is that, um, if you focus on this as here's what I don't like, I don't like using the phone this much. I don't like the time I spend on Twitter and then say, I'm just going to try to reduce that. So let me just white knuckle it. You know, I'm just going to try to reduce it. You probably have a much lower probability of succeeding. And I, I know this in part because I ran an experiment two years ago in researching the book, right? I took 1600 volunteers and basically what I had them do was spend 30 days not using what we called optional personal technology. So things like social media and online news and games. Uh, this had, didn't involve things, work things like email, et cetera, didn't involve that. And you could really see who succeeded and who failed. Those who really came into this with just a white knuckle, I want to use this less, so let me just stop using this technology, had a very hard time. So who did well? Those who really adopted the full minimalist program, which is I am going to aggressively identify through experimentation and self-reflection what I really care about, what matters to me, what I want to do with my life and my time. I then am going to design my technology use habits to amplify these things. They're much more likely to stick with that plan because what they're doing there is working from a, a place of positivity. I'm trying to get these changes in my life because these are incredibly going to be powerful for me. I want to focus on these things I care about. It's going to make my life much better. And here's the tech use plan that gets me there. They're way more likely to succeed than just saying, I look at my phone too much. Let me, let me try to stop doing it. Because if you just do that, A, uh, you face an existential void, a lot of people. They spend so much time now distracting themselves from themselves and things that are hard in the world by just looking at the screen that when you take it away, it's just terrifying. Mm -hmm. And B, it's really boring if you don't have anything to actually backfill that time in with. So that's my advice. You should not think in terms of how do I do this bad thing less? You need to think in more in terms of how do I do these good things more? That's much more likely to stick. Okay. Let me jump to, um, you know, uh, one questioner 
says, you know, you know that social media is designed, you know, to have this addictive quality. Um, and your third recommendation, recommendation is to ignore those aspects of it that, that don't align with the values we've chosen. How do you outsmart the designers of those platforms? I mean, how do you kind of deal with the fact that they've been working on these, figuring this out for a long time, how to keep people sucked in? Well, I have a whole chapter on this in the book called Join the Attention Resistance, which is all about the different ways that people are actually trying to do exactly that, to outsmart the addictive uh, capabilities of these platforms. But I can tell you the simplest, most effective thing you can do, get, off your, get it off your phone. Almost all of the attention engineering, the stuff that really makes it compulsive, assumes mobile version. So once you're using on your desktop, you've cut out maybe 80% of what makes these things addictive. Now let's put in a little bit of friction. So don't save the password. Don't put in your password manager. So it's okay, well I have to go to facebook.com. I gotta type in my password and let me look it up, right? A Little bit of friction. Now you really cut down the amount of times you're gonna bother doing that. And then once you're in there, uh, if you're optimizing, right? So the key to optimization is you have to have a cost function. Right, so if we're going to use sort of uh, uh, ORCS kind of geek talk here, you need a cost function to optimize. So once you know why you're using a particular technology, you now have a cost function. You're using it to help this thing that's really good. So now once you know what you're using it, once you're on your desktop computer and you've had to type in your password manually, you can now start to deploy high tech tools to basically uh, cover or obfuscate the stuff that you don't need to get this thing you really value. And so in the book, for example, I talk a lot about different ways that people have defeated a lot of the Facebook features, a lot of things people do so there's no newsfeed. They just go straight to groups, so they go straight to events. Uh, YouTube, with YouTube, it's almost, you know, it makes a night and day difference if you have the browser plugins that takes the recommendations and gets rid of them. Then YouTube just becomes this like fantastic library. I need to learn how to do X. Great, let me type it in and I can find like a great instruction on it. And there's no algorithmically optimized recommendation. So you're, you cannot fall down a rabbit hole. It, it takes the cost benefit of YouTube and just makes it like 100% in your favor. So that's what I would say. The simplest thing, don't do any of this on your phone. That's where they, that's where the, the attention engineering is optimized. That's where they live. That's where they make their, that's where they make their valuations right there. Do it on your desktop, make it a little inconvenient. And if you know why you're using it, consider using tools like plugins to actually get rid of the more addictive features. If you do this, the amount of time you spend on social media, the people who do these type of things, they, they're, they're using it like an hour a week. And yet they're getting 98% of the benefits of the things that they really care about. They still get all those benefits. I want to, um, I know we're coming up on our time and I want to make sure we get to, this is our most popular question um, from Kristen. She wants to know, do you have any advice for fighting procrastination, especially procrastination and resistance to deep work? I'm trying really hard to increase deep work and my deep work muscle, but I procrastinate for hours, even though I don't use social media, mostly chores, podcasts, reading stuff, which still yeah. sounds pretty good to me, but she wants to know what you think of that. Um, so I'm a time block. That's my short answer. So uh, clearly differentiate, you know, if we're talking about work, working hours from non-working hours. During your working hours, don't drive your day off of a list. You instead want to actually allocate work to time. So during this half hour, I'm going to do this. During these two hours, I'm going to work on this. During this hour, I'm going to work on this. Literally actually block out. I use a column, you know, where you have the, the, the hours of the day going down the rows. And you can actually block out the hours and label what's happening in them. Uh, I even have a planner coming out in November that's just for time blocking. So it has it formatted to do this, to do this really well. Um, time blocking makes a huge difference. Give your time a job and it completely changes your relationship to work. It puts you in a mindset of, I've tried to build an optimal plan for what I wanna do with my working hours today. I wanna to work deeply here. I wanna do email here and email here. I have this meeting here. You see the whole chessboard. You move the pieces around strategically. And then when you're in a particular time block, you're much less likely to procrastinate because now you say, you know, my schedule really depends on me doing this for the next 60 minutes. And if I don't, I mean, if I go and, and, and look at Twitter instead, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna blow past this time block and then I'm gonna have to stop everything and rebuild my schedule for the rest of the day and confront viscerally that I did that. And I don't really wanna bother, I guess I'll just keep working on this thing. But from the other hand, you're like, I have a list of what I generally want to do. You suppose like, well, I'm sure I'll take a few breaks today, that's reasonable, so why not right now? And you end up uh, spending much more time. The only warning I'll give you about time blocking is that 
uh, it's very, very intense, right? When, you, when, you, when you're actually going from one thing to another and giving it your full concentration, it, it makes you incredibly productive. You'll get about a 2x increase in the amount of valuable output you produce. But without that sort of slowness and those breaks or this or that, it's also really draining. So you're going to find yourself, it's, it can be hard at first when you do time blocking, uh, how draining it is. But it does allow you to take a confined uh, chunk of time and get a lot out of it. So it, it's been my, my, my whole thing, what I'm kind of known for is that even though I wear a lot of hats as a researcher and professor and writer, uh, I don't work past 5.30. And I do it with time blocking. Now, I'll tell you, 5.31, I'm exhausted. So it's not like a free lunch, but it does allow you to, to extract a ton out of your time. So it's a long answer to a short question, but I would say time block your work time as opposed to just running it off of a list or, or God forbid out of a running it off of like a, an email inbox and just sort of seeing what's in there and then taking breaks in between. It's just a, um, I have a new book coming out about this next year called A World Without Email that really gets into the intersection of knowledge work and how our brains actually function. Um, but that's a terrible way to take these cognitive resources and get a good return on it. So I'm a big time blocker fan. Got it. Um, well, we have a lot more great questions. Um, unfortunately, I think we've just kind of run up on the time we have for today. Um, I want to, on behalf of the Alumni Association, thank everyone who tuned into this faculty forum online. Um, Professor, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if your question wasn't answered, um, the alumni office staff are going to forward him all the questions that we didn't get to on air. Um, I'm supposed to remind everyone that all of the broadcasts are available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel uh, within a week of broadcast. Um, you can also tweet about today's chat uh, or send follow-up questions or feedback to alumnilearn at mit.edu. Um, yeah, thank everyone so much. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.